Yeah, boy, I just wrote down songbirds and shit because I never remember the name of this book. <laughs> Um, and I tell you this whole time I thought it was the ballad of snakes and songbirds I've been saying it backwards for the last three months I'm glad it's not just me songbirds and snakes guys <laughs> songbirds and snakes this is why we rely on you Kiki because you give us the correct things <laughs> oh welcome to the smells like teen angst podcast um I am joined by my cohorts Jordan and Kiki for us to discuss the Final installment, prequel installment of it's the, the prequel, the prequel, maybe it's not the prequel. Final, um, installment of the Hunger Games series, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. So, I'm just gonna start by saying that this book was not what I thought it was gonna be. I had a like preconceived notion of what I wanted out of a President Snow origin story, and this was not it. I just want to say, as someone who fell so deeply in love with the Hunger Games, this was the biggest shock. <laughs> it, okay, I don't want to judge the book for it not being the book that I wanted it to be. And I'm going to say that Fair. straight up. It was not the book that I wanted it to be. Uh, that being said, just even trying to take what we got on surface level, I was frustrated by the end of it. Just very frustrated. Yeah, I feel you. Like I don't know if you guys had the same idea of um, what you wanted, but for me, I wanted basically what this book was. I would have, I want like a truncated version of it, and that's part one. Like I thought we were, it was going to be a prequel leading up to him becoming President Snow, and not just like a moment in his life, as well as the semi origin of the Hunger Games that we know today. What I thought it was going to be and what I wanted it to be was somewhere in between those two ideas, right? I I like what was on paper, but I feel like it got rushed at the end. And I wanted, like, yes, I want the history of the Hunger Games and how the Hunger Games got to be what they were. But I also want to know how President Snow became President Snow. And I will say I was very frustrated when we got to the end because we get this glimpse into how he kind of, you know, turned bad and got there. Yeah. But we don't get all of it. And I feel like that's just an issue with prequels in general. I call it the Rogue One curse because I feel like Rogue One is the best prequel that exists, right? And I feel like it's the best yeah. because it's such an intriguing, engaging movie. But you do get like three quarters of the way in and the audience has this realization oh my God, all these characters have to die because I've seen the next movie. I know what happens. None of them are in it, right? Yeah. And like Rogue One handled that very beautifully. I feel like most prequels don't where it's just like, you know where these characters end up because you've already seen the next movie. And yeah. so it's interesting to see how they got there. And like, I wanted that with, why do we not know how Tigress ended up in that fucking basement? I'm sorry. Like, I'm just going to jump yes. ahead right now to the very end. Yeah, no, go what for it. What the fuck? Like, because this That's is going to be a little so different. frustrating to me. Yeah. Agreed. And just so people who are listening, this will be a little different because the strike, we will not be doing the compare contrast that we typically do. This is just us talking about this book. So it's not going to be step by step comparison. We are just going to be talking about the things that stood out to us, really, I feel like. Yeah. And I mean, a large part of this is that you expect a prequel to definitely lay the foundation to a lot of things that come across during a series. Mm -hmm. And we want all the backstory to know that we can get. And I feel like this book particularly built up what we were thinking was coming to a crescendo about how this person became this person. And it all kind of just pinhole ended. And yeah. you were like, okay, well, why'd you waste like 30 chapters trying to make me think that there was two sides to this person? Like they are just as faced as I saw them from the beginning. Yeah, I think like, uh, how do you, Coriolanus? Is that how you say his name? Coriolanus. 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 Whatever. Coriolanus. 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 I said to my sister who's read this book, I was texting her while well, read it. I was like, these names. And she's like, look, it's like Greeks were hippies. And I'm like, okay. It is though. <laughs> I was like, fair enough. You're probably right. Um, He, this... He is like the ultimate simp that hates himself for it. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Yeah. 
whole storyline I thought was it very much is tropey. It's the guy who falls in thinks he falls in love with a girl, but like I'm like, but it, then it doesn't follow in the trope of like the girl dies and that's what his catalyst is. No, he just thought he was in love with someone he's not. He was infatuated with her. And then when it came down to it, was always gonna choose himself, you know, because when when we talk about the end of the book, he's like, oh, well, everything's worked out for me. This is here. No one's going to catch me. So I'm just going to go back. We'll be fine. She'll be fine. She'll be able Everything's to coming up Millhouse. Everything's coming up Millhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just thought that was crazy. But I do, I listened to the audiobook. So I just want to point out a couple of things that I thought were fun and great because I don't want to shit on this the whole time. The audiobook is read by Hans from Frozen, Santino uh, Fontana, FYI. Oh. Oh. Yeah, okay. that is Mr. Okay. Hans from Frozen. So I was like, a villain reads a villain. Um, I love that Snow's family is like part of the one percent, but then dropped the lowest rung of it. You know, they're like going to lose their homes, they're going to lose their apartment. His grandma yeah. is dealing that, with dementia. That pseudo rich, faux riche thing. Like, I adore that as someone who grew up in like a very affluent area, but was actually pretty like impoverished. I was like, I relate to this because you have to keep up to a certain standard, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just be like, yeah, this is thrift clothes. You have to be like, mm, I bought at a vintage shop. Like, you know, you have to add some type of little chic sparkle to it. So I was just like, I feel for him. I understand a little bit, but I we never got the answers as to why he became who he became and what we know from having read the series. Like what happened to grandma? Uh, clearly she's probably dead. You know, yeah, how did old. you, how'd you learn grandma about died. all the flowers? You know, when yeah. she can barely entrust a single rose to you, why is Tigress living in a basement? <laughs> I did love that Tigress turns out to be his cousin. There was a lot of random fan service okay. and a lot of moments, so, you know, when we get excited, hold on, Jordan, I'll let you go in just one second. Um, okay. You know, we get excited when they're like, they said the title, right? I feel like that happened a thousand times in this book where it wasn't the title, but it was like hints and nods to the future series that everyone's supposed to be so excited about. But by the time they hit the 50th one, I was over it. But Tigress being his cousin is fun. Go ahead, Jordan. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I was going to say on the note of him, um, his pseudo richness, I thought it was very politically relevant, right? Because I think we look at a lot of, um, I'm trying to be very savvy, but I feel like a lot of our listeners are probably on the same political spectrum that we are. But, you know, when we talk about how a lot of people get like kind of sucked into the cult of personality, we talk about how a lot of people don't see themselves. They don't see that reality of like, you are a very impoverished American right now and you're not voting or behaving in your interest. They all see themselves as temporarily, temporarily embarrassed millionaires. And yeah. that 100% was Snow and Grandma. I'm like, they were they were still millionaires in their mind. They were just temporarily embarrassed yes. and they were going to climb back up and he was going to be president. And like, this is the one time where it worked out for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, was I'm able like, to, like con his way back into wealth and he did eventually become president. But like he had to do terrible things to get there. And I do think that's like the one moral that we can get out of this book is like, accept your circumstances and don't do terrible things. <laughs> Yeah, but like in the end, he did like one terrible thing. I feel like, you know, him ha being thrown into the Hunger Games because um, Sir, Sir Janus, Sir Janus, like it has a conscience and goes in there and he kills someone to get out. Like that's not a terrible thing. However, betraying your friend because you don't agree with him being against the Capitol, that's a terrible thing to do. And then shooting, um, whatever her name is, Mayfair, Mayfield. Yeah, the yeah. Mayor's daughter in this version that's not a good person um like in because he was she was coming for uh lucy i don't that's morally gray right so like he never really in my opinion overly oh he poisoned him at the end of the book that's yeah. how we find out that he's that ties so directly find into out him. he's uh -huh. a bad person he poor he po poisons he, uh, he poisons the guy the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he poisons the dean through yeah. morphling like i mean in the in the but entirety okay. of this, yeah. I was like, okay, the villain is Dr. Gall. She's crazy. Sure. She's she's beyond like she is just mental, you know. Mm -hmm. This is a Jekyll and Hyde situation. This woman does some real diabolical stuff to human beings. 
And she's basically looking for more people to be like her. Yeah. And here comes Coriolanus. He really just wants to thrive. He wants to survive. He has to be the smartest in the room. He needs the scholarship. He needs someone to sponsor him to go to college. You know, he just doesn't have it like that. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can like empathize with him and why he's trying to be such a people pleaser. And you can think the entire time that there is no malice, like the entire book in any of his actions. And then when it comes to Lucy Gray, again, when you get to the end of the book, you think back on her and you go, well, it's kind of a giant gray area too. Like, is she trying just to survive? Or is she just like the people from this district? Mm -hmm. You know, there's nods to it constantly with her relationship with, uh, what's his name? Really? Yeah. And um, it's just really sad overall, like how it ends in general and how we didn't get the wrap up that we deserved. Like, I really wanted to know what happened to Tigress. Tigress sold her body, okay? That was definitely, that was definitely referenced. For his cousin, for her cousin, and for grandma'am, and turns around and ends up hating her cousin so much that she helps rebels go to kill him. So mm-hmm. how did they have a falling out? That's the book that I want. Okay, if they're gonna introduce Ty, if they're gonna reintroduce us to Tigress and give us Tigress's backstory and make them cousins, which is honestly really cool. I need to know how they fell out so hard. I agree, and part of me, I like, I feel like. In, when we get into the the ending of this book, this the whole story leading up to it doesn't matter. They erase this Hunger Games. They never use the students again. Lucy doesn't exist. So this entire story was so unnecessary to me and why I feel like it could have been truncated to a part one that brings us back to when he is now working with Gaul and being a student under her and how he and Tigress fall out and then how he works his way through the political system to become presidents now. I feel like it's a story of how our circumstances sometimes force us to navigate the road that we're going to take, you know, yeah. because it's harder to take the moral high ground than it is to just like succumb to whatever's going to get you back to that place you want to be or that place you covet, you know, mm-hmm. and for him, he was constantly at this like crossroads of, do I want to be a good person? Not really. Like, not really. The whole time it was a, mm, I mean, no, but, you know, I want to survive. Yeah. Like, he's in survival I, I mode just think, like everyone else. I think that this book gives his relationship with Katniss some very interesting color because sure. Lucy Gray was the blueprint and Katniss definitely just followed in her steps. And so I can absolutely see why he was like primed to be prejudiced against this girl and then really like, took it to the brink because it was really just like, you remind me of my ex-girlfriend. You got to go. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And you know, everyone from District 12. (laughs) Exactly. And we still don't really know if Lucy Gray is dead. No. So for him, taking out Katniss is that satisfaction he will get that it's done, that district's over. It's this reasoning he bombed the entire district. He was like, well, now I have a reason to make an example out of them because I don't like them anyway. Yeah, you know, I'm just like he <laughs> let the capital use him as a pawn, mm-hmm. you know, by making him a peacekeeper and being like, "Oh, what was your summer learning experience?" You know, <laughs> yeah, and making and preying on what he wants people to see and believe of him constantly, which mm-hmm. is that he's better than others. And if you're being a hundred percent honest, everyone knows who that kid is that does not fit in quite well. Yeah. Like people know that like they're not doing well, the Snow family. It has to be very evident, you know. Mm-hmm. There can't be some way that people haven't talked around town being like, oh, I saw Tigress over in blah 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 street doing such and such. She works at somebody's house and cleans, like all these little things, you know. Yeah. So I'm just like, you're constantly trying to repair the snow name, make it bigger, make it better. And I was hoping that this book kind of gave us a backstory to why it happened. And really, he was just a pawn the entire time and chose to continue being a pawn. Until he was the king of pawns. 
till he was the king of pawns. Like, as we've been saying, like, we did not get the book that we wanted, but I do think that there were some good moments and interesting moments in the book we were given. I do like yes. the differences between the tributes when Katniss is in the Hunger Games versus when they use the students for the first time as mentors. Like, they're basically treated like cattle. They're kept in a stable. Their names are pulled out of a hat. Like, no one really cares. And this is also the story of them trying to figure out how to glamorize the Hunger Games and how to get more people involved and how to make it more of a sporting event. So I thought like how they were figuring out how to send gifts and how the gifts when the Hunger Games happened like failed miserably because like their little robots constantly were crashing. Um, <laughs> I just, I just yeah, that was that was, so that was really fun. And um, yeah, that is the point of this to explain how it became an eternal war. Like that's what the Hunger Games is, just keeping you at war for the rest of your life against each other. I do wish, and I'm going to start, I'm going to stop harping on the fact that we didn't get the book that we want, but I (laughs) wish that we would get like one set 15 years after this book. So you see like, okay, no, we figured out the mentor program and we figured out how to like make people want to watch the games because we've turned each tribute into a celebrity of their own making and like to you know how we get to where we are when like they're on the train and that's the best food they've ever eaten in their life and they're like purposefully fattening them up that way they're stronger and like they've yeah. learned how to actually make a production out of it so I kind of I love that we got this ghetto like first edition version of the games yes. I wish we could see like a mid edition of the games too and then yes. we get with Katniss yeah like Corey Elena says in his first year as a game maker because we know that's what He's is coming from him absolutely he's because he's going to become a game maker you know and then oh, yeah. through that and rise especially, politically. i want to see the year where he introduces the mutts because we, we talked so much about like dr gall in this book and her mutts and how crazy she was so i absolutely want to see the first year we're like you know what we're gonna put in these games some of these weird animals we've been making <laughs> <laughs> yeah because her snakes like this book does a great job of foreshadowing the same way the hunger games does so you know we get those cool mm-hmm. rainbow snakes and because he and this other girl was supposed to write a paper, but he's the only one who did it. Like they don't bite him, but they bite her and she basically dies and has to be brought back to life. I'm like, I'm like, I was so excited to see how that was going to come to play in Lucy's games. And it was done, I think, really smart. Yeah. And I did like the dynamic it kind of gave us between some of the students he was working with. When Arachne, who's taunting her tribute with food at the zoo, like that's another thing. These people are kept in a zoo. Like they're kept in a dismantled zoo that's falling apart. Like my head immediately goes to the abandoned LA zoo. It's like dilapidated. (laughs) People love to hike to it just to see the old cages. Like I'm thinking of people staying in those places that are infested with rats and raccoons, you know, being treated like actual animals. Like these people haven't eaten since they've left their districts. There's just this huge breadth of captivity that is surrounded by the games. And the fact that we know that eventually the games take this huge pivot where they become something so like glitzy. Mm hmm. It was kind of interesting to see what happened there and kind of see how the capital would enjoy this type of situation because these people were like, oh, we can come and feed the tributes. That's so exciting. And, you know, Arachne's over here taunting her tribute and her tribute's like, you know what? I'm gonna pick up this knife and stab you. Like (laughs) things like that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That moment in the book, I was like, oh shit. Cause I was like, oh, this is the book we're getting now. Like I took, I had so many guesses of the kind of book we were going to get. <laughs> and there were so many moment. moments. And I was texting Kiki where I was like, oh my God, the book is going to pick up. And she was like, girl, I'm ahead of you. Don't, don't get excited. <laughs> Cause I had already went, okay, let's just clarify again. I was the one who did not read the books before we started this thing. So Hunger Games has been my obsession this year. And of course, when we finally got to get to this book, I read it before all of you because I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. I love the Hunger Games. It's my favorite thing ever. Only to be like, well, that happened. You know, like, (laughs) okay, well, I'm disappointed just a tiny bit. You know, I just wanted to be like, so in love with Lucy Gray and Coriolanus, kind of like I was so invested in mm-hmm. Katniss. And I'm just like, I don't care if any of you win or lose. 
the most interesting person in this is Dr. Gall's crazy ass. (laughs) (laughs) Facts. I did enjoy some of the conversations that they had, which are like the moral conversations, right? Where they're trying to figure out the point of the the Hunger Games. Like Corey Lana says something like, well, people don't care about children. They only care about children when it matters. And like, that's so relevant to now. If you hear the dog, I apologize, listeners. She's mad because I took away the squeaky toy. (laughs) She's losing it. Um, I also liked how they um, had the whole moral gray ground of like, are these people, are they competitors? Are they humans? Like, how do we get people to bet on the lives of people? I thought a lot of those moral conversations were really good. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, the goal of this entirely was to kind of like make it stakesy. Make us understand how it became such pageantry. How did it become mandatory for everybody to watch it? How did it become a victor's village? These big star tributes. Because when you see something like this, where it's like, oh, people are just selected and thrown into this game and they just do what they're told. Like, why don't they just martyr kill themselves or kill these people that are training them? Mm -hmm. like what stops them and then you kind of learn where it starts and you're like oh well it kind of did used to be a little bit gully like that like when the game started there was half the amount of tributes before the actual game even began because they'd already died from like sickness or (laughs) hunger yeah in the zoo or fighting each other before they even got there you know yeah and the relationship between snow and lucy honestly feels very forced but i think that's because it's fake on both sides snow is like i'm not here for fame and glory and i'm like yes you are and he's infatuated with this woman because he's she's nothing like he's ever seen in the capital lucy is just trying to her best to survive and i don't think she ever cared for him actually romantically i think she was just using him to stay alive and i like how they manipulate each other but I was never, like you said, Kiki, invested in their relationship at all. Like, I, it wasn't a star-crossed lover situation. You know, it was very much two people I was always pretty sure were using each other in some capacity. And I was waiting to learn just how. And I didn't get, I didn't even get the just how. They just ended in there a, was who knows. A moment in the book, and I don't remember where it was, but there was a moment in this book where I was reading it. And I and I immediately thought, okay, so that's how Snow was so easily able to see through Katniss and Peeta. Oh. And I forget exactly what scene it was, but there was a moment where like he and Lucy did something. I'm like, that's why he was so e- easily able to see through the two of them because he did he originated this game. He was the very first person who played the game this way. Yes. I didn't even think of that, Jordan, but you're so right. It's exactly yeah. what happened. Yeah. Um, you know, it's if history teaches us anything, it's how to make the unwilling comply is like a quote that I took from the book. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what history is. It's yeah. like, what did we learn from the failure of internment camps? What did we learn from war and yeah. nuclear weapons? Like these are th- these are the tools we use to make other countries comply with each other, other people and Mm -hmm. districts complied with each other, you know, and it's all fear driven and adding some sparkle and glitz to it is what they're after. It wasn't grandmam's quote of saying this news is like catching fire, Kiki. That wasn't. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, because all those little, all those little drops, I was just like, okay. Also, why was it so invested in grandmam, to be honest? Like, (laughs) I don't, I don't know, but I love grandmam. She's my favorite character at this point. (laughs) <laughs> I like her too because she's she's that crazy patriot that we all have in our family from the generation before us or before our parents' generation that we just can't get to say like, actually, our country's kind of a, a heap of blaming trash, you know? They're like, nope, I'm a patriot, even though I'm starving to death and I have no health care, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Grand ma'am is that grandparent. I feel like that's in all of our families where you can just be like going to Walmart and she's like, why do you have on jeans today? We're going outside. Put on something smart. Tuck in your shirt. absolutely absolutely that person so another um 
topic that they did is I like that they're all still technically students at this school and they made them write an essay about what they love about war. And I'm just like, how messed up? Like the brainwashing that this school does to the capital people is pretty insane. Oh, it's wild. It's wild because they're really trying to mold people who live in an area who come from a more affluent or fortunate background who actually have probably suffered pretty greatly to the war as well, you know, um, see themselves as something more elite or higher than an average human. And that like conditioning, we're all seeing that here. Like, uh, we're like, how did they get there? They were conditioned to think that they are better or greater than the average person. Because one student actually brings it up. I can't remember who. Um, they were like, a, a lot of these kids who are going into the game, like they were babies, if not, not even like walking or talking yet when this war started. Like, how are they a part of this? They've never thought poorly against the capital or been about this war, they weren't old enough to think that way. Yeah. You know, they're just victims of their circumstance. And the district is, again, conditioning them like, no, they are children of traitors and children of rebels. Like, mm -hmm. they will forever be that. Punishing the children for the faults of their fathers. Like, you know, forever. As we learn later, the Hunger Games like, continue for the longest time. Speaking of fathers, I found it very convenient that we find out towards the end of the book that it was Snow's father who invented the Hunger Games. Like, yeah. just, just a little too much. Mm -hmm. Agreed. There was a couple of these, like, don't dun reveal moments that were just, or, like, supposed to be big moments that I didn't care about. Like, like we said, I did not love, I didn't care, was not invested in Snow and Lucy's relationships. Like when they kiss before she goes into the games, I got the biggest ick. I'm like, this is just gross. I'm so uncomfortable. Why don't I love this? Also, Sir Janice throws the chair at the screen and calls everyone monsters and it just ends. Like nothing comes of that. And like the Snow con family continues to have like tax issues. I'm like, what are all these random things that just actually don't matter? The end of the book had a huge MacGuffin. With the Sir Janice thing. He was apprehensive on befriending this kid. He could not stand this kid because this kid's the example of all the things he doesn't like. Someone rising to power from a district mm -hmm. who gets to come live in the capital and be affluent and have influence and do whatever they want and then can't even own up to the fact that they're like doing better like they want to be guilty about it like you know uh sir janice wanted to trade tributes with him and mm -hmm. he was like I could win, you know, if I did that, because I definitely have a better chance. But then he went back because he's like, no, I built a name for Lucy Gray. Like, why am I going to let you benefit off of my person? Even if she does die, I have the fame of being yeah. the first person to come meet a tribute, you know? Exactly. Also, can we talk about how many songs are in this book? <sighs> Too many. Too many songs. Too, Too many, many songs. songs. I'm like, why? every other page, every other chapter. Like, I get that that's her shtick because that's how, like, she charms people. That's how she... You know, that's her girl on fire moment. But did it have to keep going? Yeah. And the thing is, like the songs, I kept trying to place a time period so I can make a tune for them. Yeah. And I just couldn't get a tone for it. Like yeah. in my sense? head, I kept hearing like the Crane Wives or um, oh, my God, there's another band I'm thinking of. But it's basically just like kind of like outlaw country meets uh Monk okay. and Sons situation was where mm. I was at with these songs but I still didn't care and I I'm sorry I'm at a place where the only person that I want to read songs that an author of novels has written is Taylor Jenkins Reid she's the only person who's pulled it yeah. off for me nobody <laughs> else has pulled it off yeah it's yeah. true she did a great job with Daisy Jones <laughs> she killed it i have that book just to share with people um i do like that the hunger games are basically played in a dilapidated sofi oh yeah i think that's not very interesting and intriguing and like i think that's one way that ties it back to our world because sometimes it gets hard to really like think about like no this is a, a post-apocalyptic future this is what our world in theory turns into 
And mm-hmm. sometimes I think it's hard to to really see that, but I think it being played in a in dilapidated Staples Center made me be like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's like us looking at the co- the Roman Colosseum, right? We're like, oh, that yeah. is forever ago. So now this is like them being like, they had Taylor Swift concerts here, but now it's the Hunger Games. Yeah. In the end, Lucy obviously has to win because it's gonna it's a story about them. And she uses the snakes because he helps her and and her poison because he like gives him her his mother's like compact. I also did did anyone else find these Hunger Games boring and underwhelming and for oh, no. so barbaric? I kept waiting for action to happen, and there was dull little action in this book, and even the things that are supposed to be like gotcha moments like when um you know when he gets pulled in for cheating because they do they find the handkerchief and they find the compact and all these things that are quote unquote cheating and I'm like first of all I don't really think he was cheating I think he was just outsmarting you and you didn't like that oh great but secondly it still wasn't an impactful like action filled moment it was just another thing that happened and that's the that's my issue. It all just kind of feels like another thing that happened. And I, you know, I don't need Hunger Games to be like crazy and over the top, but these are the original ones. This is when they are the most brutal before the the government and the capital really get involved with their creatures and stuff. This is when it's morally gray for the kids to be killing each other and they're just still so upset. Like, not that they're not upset later, but they're all just like hiding and the one guy gets rabies. Yeah, and, die because the stadium gets attacked. By and the- winning, winning really gives you nothing. You know, nothing. You just get There's to no reason. go home and like cool. Now you get to go home with like the scars of how many people you probably with your PTSD. Yeah, yeah. at least Cat has got to have PTSD in a house, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's what we get in the epilogue too. Is they're like these are the things that are going to happen now, and we're going to give a victor's place, and we're going to make it seem appealing to be a part of this. And I'm like. Yes, because that is the that's the logical step. When we yeah. get to like part two, like part two begins with the Hunger Games and ends at the end of it. And when we get to part three, I do like that he, in a way, was punished. And I, again, making all the assumptions in the world, thought that this book was heading in a very different direction than it did. Because I like that Snow becomes a peacekeeper and he has to like kind of serve time in the military, you know, to like, learn about the districts, learn about the people. And I think as a big test to see if he truly is loyal to the cause and loyal to the capital. I do too. And I think in a lot of ways he, I mean, we find out, yeah, in a lot of ways, Dr. Gall was grooming him to be her next in command and we know it's going to happen, but I just think on, on paper, right. It's interesting because, oh, he thinks he's being punished and he thinks he's been cast out of society and he thinks he won't ever move up again. When really she's just giving him a good resume. Like Mm -hmm. he's going to look like, oh, he helped, you know, design the Hunger Games and he served his community by being a peacekeeper and, you know, doing his military time. And like, it just gives him a good resume. And it yeah. again, like it's a political, they're all games in this, pol- or all pawns in this political game. Yeah. And I thought it was really funny how self-important he thinks he is as a peacekeeper. Cause he's like, what if people recognize me from the Hunger Games? Oh, and they're going to see me as a peacekeeper. It's going to be weird. And like, no one gives a shit. Like no one. And I just thought that was really funny. He's like, because no one here watches it. So they don't know who I am. And he's like so offended. To me, it's like when a popular girl goes oh, from her high school to college and she thinks she's still going to be popular. And then she gets there and realizes like you are one of 3,000 new freshman students. Nobody knows who you are. And nobody cares. You're not that cute. Like <laughs> <laughs> You're charming. His whole thing is President Snow was always charismatic which I get, I can see that in the book with how he manipulates people like from friendships to Lucy. Lucy even in this uh, section sings the hanging tree, which we all know from the first series. Yeah, it was like, you know, a District 12 kind of- Anthem in a way. Anthem secret song that we all liked, you know? Mm -hmm. A song that people in the Capitol probably have never heard. It was a call to her district. Exactly. And then we get like a hint of what is to come with, we get that execution and then he learns about which the execution was real like rough because they're like we just can't lift them because they won't die fast enough and I was like jeez 
Louise. Wow. <laughs> you know? So they have to like drop them. I was like, well, okay, thanks for explaining that to me. And we get the mocking jays, and he has like this whole conversation about the mocking jays. And like it it would be fine if it wasn't information that we all already know, like in depth. I wish they had picked something else. I I kind of liked it because it was like, oh, okay, this explains why he we knew he hates mocking jays coming from the previous series but we just think he hates them because like oh it's a capital embarrassment and now we realize like no he doesn't hate them because the capital had a failed experiment he hates them because of his own personal embarrassment because he had to go live in district 12 and he got disturbed by hearing the mocking jays and he wanted to use them for target practice it's his own personal ego but again for me i agree with you from the standpoint of like we already know that he hates them like this, again, is just the curse of the prequel where we're getting information that we already know. It was just tough for me to, I was like, okay, and like just like skipped ahead. Even their first meeting when he's like, learns that Lucy's alive and he's going to go see her perform and they see each other like for the first time, I can just see that scene in my head and it just like everything just kind of falls flat and doesn't really go anywhere. And I get that it's because of what's about to happen with Sir Janice and uh, the betrayal and like Lucy kind of figuring it out because he has a Freudian slip about killing three people. And she's like, who's the third person? And he's like myself. And she's like, no, nah, you, this is on you, bro. You did this and runs away. Once that last scene of her running away happened so fast. Like I feel like the end for what was a very long book, the ending was so rushed. It was super rushed. And, I, and like snow lives in this I think it's really funny because we all make jokes about like delusional land right now, like live in the Delulu, right? And Snow mm -hmm. is absolutely the Lulu. <laughs> Lulu living in the Lulu because he thinks like Lucy, he, he thinks that Lucy is going to want to be with someone that is a capital man. I call him like the company man, right? The, oh, like the nationalist and like listening to their conversations, they do not, it's very, what you guys brought up before Katniss and Gail, they don't see the world in the same way. He won't give up the things. And it just, it feels like a conversation I have with my dad all the time, listening to them discuss the world and like what they want. Yeah, it was, it was really awkward. And for me, it, it was like the reality of them <laughs> coming to terms with it. They never really liked each other because they never really knew or understood each other. They liked the idea of each other. They liked yeah. what the other person could give them, but they didn't actually like each other. Yeah, like. I'm like, dude, Lucy's not going to love someone that supports the Hunger Games. Absolutely not. You know, <laughs> like she was in it and you're going to like marry a woman that's like, I was in the Hunger Games. I'm going to say why they're great. No, that would never, never happen. Yeah. And Lucy's not going to go with what's not in her best interest. Mm -hmm. You know, Lucy is out here just trying to get by like lucy we already knew lucy was rough from the minute she got chosen and she throws a snake down somebody's dress like yeah. lucy is not one to be trifled with can we talk about how from the streets lucy was because not only did she throw a snake at that girl then we find out she threw the snake at that girl because that girl just stole her man like that is the most good shit i have read in a book in a long time you threw my man you stole my man i'm gonna throw this snake at you yeah basically like down her dress yeah down her dress and like but that girl had her father had enough power to send her ass to the hunger game yeah i was like dang and you know yeah. if they had run away she and billy would have ended up together like there was yeah. no no well and this is my next thing kiki to your point where you were like oh lucy was only going to do what's in her interest snow was only going to do what was in his interest i could not believe this the lulu boy thinking he's gonna run away and live in the woods with this girl when he was using Sir Janice to get his mom's cooking. Exactly. And using Sir Janice's money, his food as a way to barter and live a good life out in District 12. Even the monologue when he does run away with oh my Lucy. God. The entire time he's like, ew, icky, water, rain, wet, mud, yuck, cold, nasty. Like... I could not handle it. At first I was like dying and cracking up because I I often tell people like, when it comes to camping, I am a two day, one night girl. Like I cannot be dirty for long. I need hot water. <laughs> so I'm just like, this is me. Oh Cause God. if it started raining on the hike up to the spot, I would be so done. I thought it was the most relatable, like Cornelius, Cornelius, like Snow has ever been in that moment when he was like, I've owned, owned only out here a day and I'm already done. 
Like I, I'm yeah. gonna, go, I'm good. <laughs> Am I really gonna do this for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I also like how they definitely preyed on his need to be the best. Absolutely. You know, um, to get him back at home because. He, it could have gone one way where like he was so in love with Lucy, you know, even hearing that like he got accepted into officer school, he would be like, well, I don't care. I still love her. Like, what's the point? I'm just going to be an officer and then still work my way up from here and there. But then inflating his ego saying, oh my God, you're the youngest person to ever pass the test with flying colors. And you're going to special school in district two and mm. you're not going to be trained to be an officer here you need to come back because you're so amazing of course the entire time he's just walking through the woods with her being like i'm really gonna give up how amazing i am like i'm a snow for <laughs> her in the woods in the rain no i could just see it like the, the grumbling like a toddler of like oh, mm-hmm. oh, oh, bugs. Uh-huh. <laughs> my feet hurt <laughs> This uh, outfit is heavy. <laughs> can we? T- I want to know what you guys think about his jealousy over Billy and his possessiveness of Lucy. Uh, it wasn't that he loved her. It was that that was his toy at the moment. You know, like Snow is very much a uh, pampered, spoiled boy who wants what he wants. He wanted Lucy and so nobody else could have her, you know, like, and it's not even that he wants her to keep. It's just that, you know, like nobody else can have you because I decided you're mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same way he wouldn't trade tributes with Sir Janus. Yeah. You know, if he was so great, he could have made any tribute, you know, who Lucy Gray was. But he claimed ownership, and that's just what he wants. She was his pet. Uh, when he turns in Sir Janus, I think his mental gymnastics are a piece of art. Because he's like, he'll be fine. His parents will find him. And his parent, his dad will just buy another wing to the school. And like, it's, to, I'm not betraying him. I'm helping him because nothing's going to happen to him. He's going to be fine. And I'm like, sir. Bro, get it together. District, you're in district 12. His parents aren't here. Absolute like, trash. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, his friend, his only person who cared about him as a human being, he got zoinked. So... Um, and as you said, Jordan, this the ending of this book happens so fast. He and Lucy so are fast. In the, so fast. He and Lucy are in the woods. He sees the gun because his whole thing of why he ran away is because the gun was out there somewhere and it was just a matter of time until he was caught. And he sees the gun. Someone had hit it in this cabin that no one was ever going to find. And she figures it out and like runs away. And then they have this weird like cat and mouse chase in the woods, kind of, because she like, gets him bit by a snake she does a red herring with her bandana like which do you think she already knew and she got him out there for a reason to try and kill him or do you think she figured it out in that moment when he said he killed three people I think she figured it out in that moment yeah I feel like it was very much like her setting that as a pivot just the way she laid the traps and tried to get undercover in a way they never saw her again is what is said. I mean, we can believe she died, but I would like to believe that she actually got away. What he was hearing was her probably playing with him with mocking jays or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Like she knew she knew the area more than he did, which means he was walking into her trap, her own hunger mm-hmm. games, which they kind of say, which is kind of fun in a way. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't believe that she lured him out there to kill him. And that she was just like working with Billy or something. And well, Billy's dead. Mayfair yeah, and well, Billy are- exactly. But I'm just saying, like, you know, part of the whole Covey group, it was like an ultimate plan to kill this peacekeeper eventually or avenge Sir Janus. I don't think it was any type of situation like that. I think it was just like she truly learned, I can't trust you. After mm-hmm. singing that whole song about being the person she trusts. And then the end happens and we get the epilogue of his, where, you know, we talked about the, the supposed to be like the dun, dun, dun of his dad being the creator and that the cre- everyone who's, what's his name? I don't remember his name. The Dean? Uh, Dean? Uh, Dean Dean. Highbottom or whatever. Yeah. Dean you know, of He's like, I never wanted this. It was all your dad. <laughs> and then he kills him. And then he kills him with his own like morphine drip, basically. Like, that poison morphling. But also, like, why? Why kill High Bottom? Well, I, no, I get why I kill High Bottom. High Bottom was a pain in his ass from the very beginning. He took credit for his dad's thing, you know, uh, for his dad's idea. And I, I think in some ways he probably blames 
high bottom, not just for being a pain in the ass, but for his family's downfall. And I mean, it's also just the, you have to see him poison someone. So you know how he becomes president Snow who poisons everyone because the guy from district four told us that in the last book. Overall, like if I reread this now, knowing what it was, I don't think I would be as upset with it, but it isn't as entertaining as the original trilogy or in my opinion, as poignant as the original trilogy. No. No, I I don't want a part two because part one was just so disjointed in general, you know, like, yes, it'd be very interesting to see what the Hunger Games became and come back when he is, of course, a game maker. But I also just so greatly do not care about Snow. And this book did not help me care about Snow. Mm-hmm. At any case in point, it kind of just shattered it all at the end. And broke down those walls where you're like okay cool any story I tried to make up or connect while I was trudging through this book that moved kind of at a glacially pace so far was unnecessary because everyone is exactly who they are from surface when they were introduced yeah I think the only way I would accept a sequel is if it was Hamish's games yeah yeah, I would love to read about Hamish's games, but I think that um, I think the issue is that the Hunger Games, the original trilogy, was very much like a political allegory, or like there was a lesson to it, and and the characters were kind of secondary to that lesson. And I think this book really tried to be a character study, but there was no point to it at the end. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it g- it gave us a lot of examples of people that you know, we don't wish well and people who get kind of what they deserve, you know, like with Arachne and Clemencia, Mm -hmm. you know, getting bit by the snake and all of that. You start to feel for Snow in those moments. You're like, well, those characters are those characters and that's what people like that deserve for a second. And then you realize like, no, actually everybody's bad. Everybody just just sucks and this whole idea sucks and you're the reason it moved on and you suck <laughs> <laughs> overall i give it a do i would not read again i don't well, really have any- i can say i actually read it twice because i finished it so far before we talked about this that i had to refresh myself to see if i was just being like overly negative <laughs> you know i came off the fourth wing high i'm just saying we should read a fourth wing for the podcast we should do it. Is that what we should read? Um, we have one that we have to review because they asked us to. Huzzah. And then we can read that one. Yes. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, I mean, the second book comes out in November. Yeah, so exactly. It, so it could be good back to back. Um, but yeah, I don't really have much else to say about this book. I feel like I've I've said my piece. Do either of you have anything else to say? No, nope, this is we covered it. We did it. We did, we did it. it. I um, mean if if you're a fan of the Hunger Games, stay a fan of the Hunger Games. Like, yeah, I would be. I'm very curious to see what other readers thought of and like thought of this book. So, if you have thoughts and comments, shoot us an email. Send us a send us a DM on the Instagrams, the Twitters, you know, all that good stuff. Um, but otherwise, that's it, and we will be back with another book soon. Bye. 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 Ha, ha, ha.